Yeah, so people, if you can just come over here, that would be good. So well, hello everyone, and welcome to this to this breakout session. Uh, for me, it's a pleasure today to introduce to Rod the Wolf. Um, well, it, it sounds kind of weird when you hear yourself by the <laughs> speakers. Um, so Lord is a medical medical doctor by, 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 by training and has been involved and working for the pharmaceutical industries for more than 50 years, if, if I'm correct. He 15, sorry. <laughs> 15 years, not 50. Um, and he's currently holding the position of chief patient officer in Sevier. And Today he's going to explain us about what I think is a very burning topic for the patient community, which is the clinical trial design and how to select the starting points, especially because we are increasingly, as patient advocates, being involved in this uh, pathway of clinical research. So a lot, my pleasure, the floor is yours. Thank you very, thank you very much, Alfonso. So let me indeed start uh, again. So my name is Lode, the rest forget it. Um, what else do you want to know about me? Yeah, but all we don't have time. We take long talks, you know. <laughs> no, what do you want to know? Why did you go to pharma? The money? It's a good point. Why did I go to pharma? Was it the money? No, it wasn't the money. Uh, in fact, I, I um, was making more before I went into pharma. I was a practicing clinician. Um, the reason I went into pharma is because I love change. And um, I could not see myself to either stay in the same specialty for my whole career or two, I was a GP in a village, and I mean, you take care of about 2,000, 2,500 people. I just couldn't imagine just having a circle of patients of only 2,000, 2,500 people, and always the same, and having to go to the church, and having to go to the local football club, and being popular, and <laughs> always have, I, I just couldn't bear with that. So that's, that's the honest answer. And so I've, I've been very lucky, and I've, I have continued my clinical practice for almost 20 years, because I, I really love it. And, uh, for example, I've combined my vacations with clinical practice. It's not that I didn't love it. And uh, afterwards, yes, the money got better. But that was not because I was a doctor, but because I started climbing the, the management hierarchy. It's a good question, actually. Why do people go? In fact, my father didn't speak to me for three years when I did that. Because he was a doctor. I was the only of five. Uh, having done medicine, he wanted me to succeed him. He was trained in the idea that the only way you can be a doctor is to see patients from morning to evening and so he was very very disappointed and um, for three years if he ever asked how it was how are things at the factory um, <laughs> but later in life then he realized that uh, you can also do good for patients uh, on that side and, and so we uh, we were surprised what are other questions So, um, yeah, so I have actually been almost 30 years, not 50, but 3 zero, 30 years in pharma. I started in, I went from clinical to pharma in 1989. And the end of 2006, in beginning of 2000, I stopped. Uh, at that time, I'd been five years chief patient officer. And we could talk about what that means. But um, I was at a point in my life that I needed to make a very big decision because my mother was in a very bad situation, also medically and uh, health-wise. And here I was going around preaching about patient centricity, but I wasn't really doing it. So I said, okay, you gotta live up to that. Stop preaching, start practicing. So I, I, um, I left the job, I left industry with the idea to never return. And I, for six months, did half time to take care of my mother, who I'm very happy to say is still alive, and she's 84 just two weeks ago. And the other half time, I did something that I always wanted to do, which is uh, ONG, NGO. I worked, uh, started to work for uh, Doctors of the World. And for the homeless people, I gave uh, medical consultations in the evening, um, and in the winter. So that means uh, side of society, the illegals, but also a lot of refugees. Did that for six months. And then other things happened. And, and then actually a month, it's actually uh, six weeks ago, this today, six weeks ago, I did join back to the industry because I created Corvallis because I was being asked to consult on patient and how to bring patients into clinical trials into the organization by pharma because I was quite well known. And so I couldn't do that because I had no way to actually make, build them. So I created with my wife, with my wife Corvallis 
And, um, and so then I had a billing method. But so Corvallis is asleep now because now I'm back into uh, an, being an employee. Anything else? No? All right, so um, today we have, uh, we have about 50 minutes left and I'm going to start the clock. So, okay, right. Um, to talk about clinical trial designs. And there are several ways to do this. In my, until a few years ago, before I really started talking a lot to patients, I would have done it the doctor way which means I would have had a slide deck, which I have at 67 slides, and I would just have gone one by one by one and telling you everything I think you should know. I have, in the last few years, and certainly since I took my sabbatical, I have understood this is not the best way. It's much more difficult for me because I cannot prepare so well, but I'm going to do what I did for myself. I would like to know what you want to know, and we start from that. So, what? why did you come to here? Actually, you're much more more people than I thought you would. I thought, oh, five people are going to be interested in clinical trials. So tell me, I will write down the questions and then we'll try to start. So, and you can continue to ask, but what do you want to know about clinical trials? What is important for you to know? Yes, sir. How, how are the endpoints considered? Oh, so it's about endpoints. And when you say how are they considered, do you mean how are they created or how are they interpreted? Okay, this selection of endpoints, okay. All right, good, that's a very important one specifically, this, okay. It's a very good one. Yes, please. Drug being tested. Sorry, drug being tested. Drug uh, uh, being tested. Yes, what do you want, what's, the yes, device. what's so the question? I want to know what sort of, of uh, drug it is, how is it described in a clinical trial, and it, uh, its purpose. I'm not sure I understand the question, so I need to clarify that. So you want to know at what point in a life a drug gets tested or no. okay okay yeah okay what sort of drug is tested in which trial there are different types and when i guess mm -hmm. good that's that's uh, all Yes. Yeah. I, I want to know interaction between case history, which provide doctor yes. to treat patients. Case history. And clinical trial. I hope that there is no difference. Uh, the only way is to uh, collect several good case histories. Okay, case history. That's a very good one. Case histories or case series, as they call it. Yeah. All right, that's a good question. Yes, please. I have a question then regarding the open the samples or the number of patients are quite small, and I think you draw quite a yep. specific conclusion based on the, so it is the, about the statistical significance. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, that's a good one. Yes, sir. How are decided the, the, the administration intervals? How are decided the? So how many times you give the drug or how many times you study? How many times you? Ah, okay, yeah. Okay, so dose and administration, that's what you're asking. Okay, good, dose. There was one more person. I don't want to uh, stop on you. Yes, sir, you had a question. Oh, so selection of the trials made and who, by whom? Selection of trials, uh, what do you mean? Can you say a bit more? You mean for patients to decide which trial they go or for? Yes. Which trial? Which, which trial uh, has to be chosen? By you. I don't know by whom. How to select a trial? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, wait, Anita, you try and clarify his question or is it a separate question? Yes. Is that what you want to know? Yes. How does a company decide this? When to do a clinical trial. So that's, that's a little bit also here. Okay, good. And then, sir, you have another. And then we'll get started. Yeah, when do a clinical trial you have to collect data from the patient? Yes. I mean, ask them about the adverse uh, dying effects. Of yeah. Somebody 
can be afraid if it begins to I mean it's feeling very bad, but then it will be thrown out of the <laughs> that's a good one. This is a int very interesting one. Wow, we have a great, so where shall we start? Um, maybe we can start, let me see. All right, I'll start with this one. So what is a case history? And, and then we start from there. A case history is basically exactly what the word says. It is the description of one case, and I hate the word case. Because already we doctors reduce people to their disease. Now, if you then call it a case, you totally depersonalize it. All right? So, but anyway, that's the way the scientists look at it. So that means that the, the number of, of people in it is equals one. N equals one. And what you do is you describe everything that you know about the case, how the history was, what symptoms, what you did, and then you see what, what comes out of that. All right? Now, the question is, what can you do with a case history? How big evidence is this? Because science and approval and reimbursement, which means access for you, is based on two principles. And that's very important. If there's one thing you remember, then that's the thing. That the basis of science. Science is actually a belief system. It's not like chemistry or engineering. It's a belief system. How does it work? There are two things that you need to do. You need to have representability okay, and these are two difficult words and the other one is reproducibility. What does it mean? All clinical studies end up in a publication or so they should. That's very important, okay? And we can talk about that separately, but that's not a clinical design issue. And what they do is they spend a lot of time describing exactly what has been done, right? And then they describe what, how they measured, what they measured, and what they saw, and what they think that means, right? And if the other readers, the other scientists, believe that what you have written if they would done the same experiment, it would give the same result, then they accept it. So it's a little bit like I invent a new recipe for baking a cake. And I describe exactly what flour I took, what butter, what this, what that, and I put it together, and I report that, hey, it was a cake. <laughs> that recipe, if I publish that recipe to the point that others say, okay, it's detailed enough that I can reproduce it, yes? And if I do it, I will get this result. Then people accept, okay, this is a cake recipe. They don't all, well, they're not all going to make it. They basically accept, okay, this is how you make a cake. And then the next question is, in science, how do I make the batter for the cake? And so science moves on the moment we've accepted something. And to accept it, we first need to believe that the result is reproducible, all right? The second thing we need to know is, okay, this, I believe that if this patient came to me, this case history, with this history, if I had done this, I believe I would have the same result. Then that's a very strong case. But is this patient representable? That's the big issue. And this comes back to the statistical point. If the, we are all unique humans, right? And so that means that by default, a case history is not representable. Because I give you five ladies of the same age each of them di diagnosed with breast cancer uh, that looks the same on the x-ray, they will have five different outcomes, even if I give them the same drug. And so this representability is the most difficult one, especially in rare diseases, which comes back to the other question, right? Now, the bigger the effect is that you will get, because, okay, so here's, here's I'm giving you simple formulas, all right? Um, there's a person, okay? What does this clinic do? If I add to this person the drug, okay, then this person changes, right? If I add 
placebo, which is nothing, zero, then the person is the chain, the same. Understood? So all scientific studies try to do that. They will take half of the patients and give them nothing, and then half of the patient they give what they don't know, and then they will compare at the end this and this. Okay, clear? I'll, I'll make this one a B. It's easier for you to understand. That's two different people then. Pers person, Patrick and Bart. Okay, Patrick and Bart. Patrick one. But, yeah, but that makes it too difficult to go one. No, Patrick uh, on the right side. It's not the same. It's the same person, but now he's had drugs. So you're absolutely right, because that's why we need this group. It could be that this is not exactly the same. So we'll call him Patrick later and Bart later. Because maybe the study is two years later, and if you didn't do something, the disease moved on. So the disease is not exactly made of the same, nor the same thing. That's why you need this control group. So the bigger D is drug, the less patients I need to prove this. That's logic. If, 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 if for example, I have a disease, pook, pook, hello? All right, anyway, you hear me this without the microphone, but they need for the recording. So if, 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 Let's take a very bad scenario. We have a very, very bad uh, thing, and two years later, there are no bees more because everybody is gone, right? Then if you have 10... Drug. I don't need to see many patients because if I do nothing, there will also be a lot of patients because here they're more relaxed, they've just been to a nice vacation, mm. or the doctor, they now know the doctor, they're no longer afraid, or they uh, started doing a bit of exercise, right? So there's a lot of factors that could explain what, what my effect is, and then I need lots of patients. So that's how statistics work. And so this famous p value, what does it say? It tells you what is the chance that what I'm seeing is not related to D, but simply chance. Right? If it's less than 0.05, what we really say, there's less than 5% that what I'm seeing and thinking as effect from drug is simply chance. Which already gives you the message that even a p-value is not perfect. Science is not perfect. A p-value of 0.1 is of course much better because now you say it's only 1% chance that what I'm seeing is not due to the drug. Okay? So that's what the p-value is. And so what, what, you, what you therefore do when you make a study sample, you start with this and you say, okay, this comes back to when is the drug tested? What do I already know about drug D from the laboratory? from measuring animals, and from previous studies, all right? And so that means, what effect size can I expect? Am I expecting a 10% improvement, a 50, 50, or 100, right? And then I start calculating. How many patients would I need to make sure that I detect this difference, right, with certainty, with the p-value, because you then decide the power, and usually we go for a power of 80% and a 5% p-value. You can put the bar very high. I can say I want to be 100% sure at 0.1 p-value. The problem is you need more patients than there are inhabitants of Europe. Because it's a statistic. So in the end, you're going to have to make a decision. And of course, any researcher doesn't like a negative study. A negative study is a study that is, doesn't mean that the result, the drug doesn't work. A negative study doesn't answer the question. This is very important. Sometimes you want to prove that the drug does nothing, for example, no harm. A negative study is only a study that doesn't answer the question. And a, a good study starts with a very, very clear question. Because if you try to answer more questions in the same, you don't know what you're getting. It's like I take, go back to my, my recipe right, for my cake. Let's say my recipe has four ingredients. If I change all four, a little bit more flour, a bit less this, a little, and my cake fails, I have learned nothing. Because I don't know if it's the butter or the flour. 
So that means to do the study, you see what is really important. I need to start varying only the flour. I do another, I cook it one more time with more flour, and the rest I keep the same. And then I see if it works. And then I will find out exactly what the values of each. So you see, so it's it's a, it's a bit of a, a, a difficult uh, a difficult point. So let's see what we have answered. Um, so this comes to the when can we try? When can we test the drug? We can test the drug when we have enough reason to believe that it will not do more harm than benefit. There is no such thing as harmless things that we take in. If I drink right behind each other without stopping, which very four or five liters of water, chances are that I'm dead within the hour. And that's water. So it's just about finding that, that balance between benefit and risk. So what does that mean? We have what we call in drug development different phases. All right? And, and oh, I'm going to take this one. I'll turn it off. So, so the first thing we try to do is the best way to avoid harm to human beings is to not study human beings. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Right? So it's quite, quite simple. And so that means that there is a lot that is called the pre... I don't know why I'm doing red. I hate red. It's like everything's not correct. It's the preclinical phase. Okay? The preclinical phase. And that has different stages. There's chemistry. Just looking, uh, you can look, the chemist can tell you if, for example, something is extremely acid, then you already know that if you're going to give that, people are going to get burning stomach and stuff like that. So there's chemical things you can do. Then you can look at cells. Right? Specific cells. Is this drug will ultimately work on the liver, then let's take liver cells, put drugs, put them in a glass with lots of liver cells, we add a bit of the drug and we see, is it not harming the liver cells? Okay, and so we systematically test some cells. Liver is a very important one. Brain is a very important one, right? Uh, what else do we want? Muscle, you don't want things to go wrong with muscle. Nerve, so we test in the lab different types of cells. And this is one of the things where there is a credible progress happening. Incredible. Right down the road here, 10 kilometers, is an institute called IMEC. It's the, worst, the world's largest um, chip research laboratory. So the, f the, the chips that are in your iPhones or Samsungs and all of that have been invented 10 years ago there. And they're already working on the future ones. And so what they have invented is chips they have programmed the total liver cell in a chip, the size of a nail. So it's one by one centimeter. And you can now, instead of taking a cell, you can actually put the, liver, the drug in and let it go through the chip, and the chip will tell you about toxic content. And you, it's amazing, because what you can do is you can have, the liver has the active liver cells, but there's also um, fiber cells in there. There are some blood vessels. There. So you can actually recreate on a chip almost an organ, and then you can run the drug there. If you guys want to see this, go. And there's a TED talk about the, the, how we will maybe able to avoid a lot of testing in the future. So there's, that's step two, cells. Step three, one of the reasons to expand cells is already to avoid step three, which, look, I have a cat, uh, two cats. I have a dog. Uh, our fish died last week, but um, of age, I'm happy to say. Um, Animals. There are just certain things that you cannot test in cells. For example, um, mental status, confusion. Right. So you have a labyrinth, and you let a rat run in there, and after a while, the rat remembers the name, the way to get from where it's in to get to the cheese, and the computer just measures the time from going into the race to the cheese. Then you give them a drug. And if suddenly they start bumping the sides and taking 10 times, well, you know, this is going to be a drug that's not going to be good for attention, right? So there's things like the same for exercise. You can test the muscles, but you can put a, a rat in a machine, uh, like in the hamster, turn, measure, give drugs, see if it can still run like that. So there's all kinds of things like that. And I also don't like to do it, and I can tell you, everybody tries to avoid as much as possible 
to work with animals. Academic research, first of all, it's very difficult um, to keep them because you need to go back to the formula. You need to make sure that the rats are the same. So there are, you buy actually specific rats or specific mouse or even specific monkeys which have been bred generation over generation so they are comparable. Otherwise, not reproducible, not representative. So these two in principles always. So then at a certain moment, you feel satisfied that you, you have chemical proof that this drug, for example, binds the receptor or binds the gene, etc. All right? You've proven that it doesn't harm cells, right? And you've proven that it doesn't harm animals. And to give you an idea, we usually go 1,000 times higher in animals in dose than we will ever go in humans. Just as a number to remember, 1,000. Okay, just to make sure that we're on the safe side before we go into the human. And that is what's called phase one. Or FIH, which is called first in human. Now the question I have for you, if you are making this decision, so I, I, you've looked at all this data and you feel convinced, and it's not just the researcher who looks at that, the ethics committee will look at that also to make sure that, uh, that the research is not biased, because researchers want the question, but here's the ethics committee. So, what would you test in a phase one? What is the thing you want to test in the first time you're going to give this molecule to a person? What do you want to test? Safety, not efficacy. It's not at all about efficacy. Phase one is purely about safety. Now, how do you do it? Step by step, which means you first find healthy volunteers who want to do this, all right? And it's not easy because they have to agree to come for three weeks or whatever, how, many, how long the study is, how long you want to observe. The study, the first, uh, the first one is always a single dose, which comes back to the question that you asked before, a single dose. You basically give one dose, which you believe will wor could work, because it's no point testing doses that are too low to work, but that is at least a thousand times below what you've given as a maximum dose to the animal. So that gives you an idea of how we find doses, right? And you give one dose and you wait, you observe, you measure everything you can measure. You measure blood pressure, you ask them to do tests for attention, you measure everything you can for these different organs. You do uh, heart film, ECG, you know, if it's a brain drug, you'll do an EEG. So you do, that's why these volunteers, they spend quite a lot of hours because it's a lot of testing. And actually, you want to see nothing. So it's a lot of money with the purpose of finding nothing. It's funny, right? So when that happens, you have two ways. It depends what you do. You either go um, to, uh, multiple, uh, to higher dose, higher single dose. So that means you put up the dose first. Or you go to multiple dose which means you repeat the dose. Those are the two options. Now, how do you decide which one to go? If you are very afraid of your drug, you will always first scale up the dose. So that you are, you, because you will start lower. You may not start at a thousand times below the anus, you may start at 10,000 times below. So you may choose to be absolutely certain that you go for safety and you may start below the dose that you know this dose will not work. But I first want to know how it's safety it is. And then you go up to the dose that's okay. Because you are, and you go that in steps. So never the same person. The first person gets single dose low. Second person gets single dose a bit higher. Third person, and you always wait for at least two weeks until you really know because there could be a late effect, huh? And you keep following the patient for the whole time. So these studies are generally called step up studies, which is time is here. You learn something and you follow this patient. You add another one, you add another one. Now you've done three. So now you start back with the same dose, but you'll do three of them at the same time. So you can go faster. Right? So it's step by step, and every time it's a medical decision, the ethics committee has to be agreeing. It's all written out in the protocol. So that's phase one. So at the end of phase one, what do we know? This thing is safe in the doses that we think work. Good, then we go to step phase two. After one comes two, you could have guessed that. So here, this is what we call POC. 
Though, so this is FIH, because we love abbreviations. It makes us look so clever. Doctors love abbreviations, by the way. POC, proof of concept. Basically, this is the question where you want to show that the drug is actually doing what you want it to do. And it can be very basic. I have developed an antibody for a cell, maybe for my allergy cell. Right? And I've looked at if I dose the antibody high enough, it's well tolerated, there's no problem. Now I need to prove that it actually binds to that cell. And to bind, uh, well, it, if, if it's something that I eat, well, I first need to go, it needs to go from my stomach to my blood. So I first start seeing, can I see it? Can I see it in the blood? Because if it's not in the blood, then I it may bind to the cell in, in a test tube, but if it doesn't get there, so this is also where we start looking at how the, the, the traveling of the molecule is in the body. How does it go from in, through your gut wall, into the blood, through the organ where it needs to work, how it gets back out, where does it go for being broken down, and ultimately where do you eliminate it? Because we don't want to keep drug in the body because, and doses and doses. That's like, for example, mercury, which is a toxic thing, you know that? in the environment, it stays in us. So over our life, we ever, ever more mercury. And if you come to a certain toxic level, we know that's not good. So we want definitely drugs that are not accumulated, that they are eliminated. And there are two ways you can get out, main ways that you can get out of. Number one is through your pee-pee, and number two is through your caca. Very simple. <laughs> pee-pee is kidney, and caca is liver. And the kidney and the liver are very important elimination. We call this kinetics. That's from the Greek. Do we have Greek people in the, in the, in the world? Kinetic. We know this part. Like if you go to the kinesist, it's movement. It's the movement of the drug. And because we love our uh, abbreviations, we call it ADMI. Absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion. Ooh, doesn't that look much more fancy? Oh, basically, it's how the drug travels, right? So phase two is an incredibly important um, phase. Because until here, you have studied maybe 20, 30 volunteers, right? And here maybe 20, 30. Ah, would you take patients or volunteers here? What would you do? Both are right. Depends what you want to measure. If I just want to measure that the drug actually gets into the blood from the gut, well, I can do that with a healthy volunteers. Except if, the, if for example, it's a, a, a gut disease, because it may well be that the gut in the patient is working differently from the gut in the normal. So you will have to have a really good reflection whether or not to work with patients here or not. Right? In rare diseases, we go faster with patients because we know that they are so very different genetically or whatever, right? So at the end of this, we now have convinced ourselves that it's safe. And by the way, we have expanded this knowledge because here we also look at safety, of course. But we have also a clue that it should work, right? And this is where the very important question of dose is, is looked at. Where is dose? Here. So dose, we've already, we're on the when? Okay, and the dose. Because you are going to look at the dose range. And what you're trying to find is LED. And that's not the little lights. That's the lowest effective dose. Which means that you need to find a dose where you see nothing. And the ideal curve that all researchers dream of Okay. Okay. Is that you have the dose here and here the effect. Is that you see nothing. Then you reach your dose, you see the full effect. Right? And it stays there and it stays there forever. And that's what a dream looks like. <laughs> there is never ever ever the case, okay? So what you usually have is what we call a typical S-shaped curve. 
So you'll see a part where things begin to move, like the blood pressure begins to go down, the number of cancer cells begins to go down, right? And then there's another part where it's flattening off, which may not be the total result. It may be that the blood cancer cells only go down by 50%, but no matter how higher you go, you don't find any higher. Or the blood pressure goes by to 20, and then it stays, right? This, Ah, wait, that's where I was going to get. That's why I now read the red one. The one we're all very afraid of is the one where if you go up, suddenly the effect goes down. And this is only effect because now I need to put on the same graph something else if I find my black pen, which I lost here. Because this is the wanted effect, but it could also be the unwanted effect. So the adverse events. What we always would like to see is that the this, the same curves are here, right? That they are right there. Because if it, if it already starts going up adverse events here to the maximum adverse event, this is quite narrow. How do you decide to which dose to pick? Because if I pick this dose, there will be a few patients who already have the adverse event, even though most patients will be good. So what we really hope is that there's no overlap between those curves. And so the, the end of phase two is summarized in a table like that. And then you really sit down and you, okay, let's say that this is the curve. What would really happen is that doctors would sit down and look at that and say, okay, there's something happening here, but is it really bad? Is it, or is it just maybe itch? Is it headache? Is it diarrhea? Or is it something really bad? So it's not just the number, it's also what it is. And then they take a decision. And for me, that's something of the past. The only person who can decide what is worthwhile is the patient for both curves. Because you are the only ones who can say, look, I will not take a drug until I get a certain effect. Right? And you're also the only ones who can say, I will not accept more than this. Or there, it doesn't matter, the black one. And so this is what's increasingly happening now and what is the future of research is that the regulators who will ultimately approve the drug will ask patients three questions. Number one is what is your burden of disease and your burden of treatment? That's number two. But number three is what is your willingness to take risks and trade off? What are you willing to trade off? I'll give you an example. There was a drug which um, was, was used and because it looked good. And then a few adverse events came up and they were really bad ones because pe some people died, right? And on a thousand patients, maybe there was two people. But the manufacturer didn't want to take that risk and the regulator didn't want to take the risk. So the drug was taken off the market. But then the community of patients started reacting very, very badly because the ones who were the 998 were having a lot of benefits. And they were basically saying, look, we have a disease that's a severe disease that limits our life expectancy. And this drug so significantly increases that that we're willing to take the 2%. And that was the first time ever that regulators changed their opinion because the regulators said, okay, and they put the drug on the, on back on the market, but be very clear, the requirement to totally inform the patient, you have a 2% more chance of dying if you take this drug than if you don't take this drug. And so every individual patient can make the decision. What the patient was saying was, stop deciding for us. And if I look at my mother, she will happily trade quality of life for length of life, where she is. She's 84. And so sometimes she even says, look, if the quality is not good anymore, I prefer euthanasia, but that's, that's her. So, and, and this is something where, coming to the endpoints, somebody said about endpoint selection. What we are beginning to learn is that what we as scientists have always used as endpoints may not have been the complete picture. For example, most cancer drugs are looking at two endpoints. It's overall survival. So if I go back to our number one, which is the basic, this. in the group that all, all Peters, are there more Peters at the end than in the Barts? That's overall survival. And the other thing you do, if it's a cancer that will come back anyway, 
You look at the time until the cancer comes back. That is called uh, disease-free progression. So those are the two things that come back. But they are very crude. Because what come back can either be more aggressive or less aggressive. And we, it's just very binary because it, it's easier to do statistics with simple numbers. So, and the easiest thing to tell is the number of death. There's no discussion about that. Even recurrence is very difficult to measure because you have to have x-rays and all of that and you need people and you give the same radiograph to five radiologists, they may interpret it a little bit differently. That's the human factor. And so that's why science is kind of pushing back against the patient community for what they call the soft endpoints. But they're not soft. Happiness and quality of life are not soft. So the whole point is how can we agree? Because I was discussing two days ago in Basel with a group of um, um, payers who uh, even after the drug is approved, which means it's, it's the, the regulators, they approve the drug basically saying this drug is enough safe and brings enough benefit that we want our population to be able to have it. That's one decision. The next decision is for the payers to say, okay, and I'm willing to pay for it. Two different decisions, two different authorities. They often don't talk to each other. And they also don't use the same data. All right? But it's even worse than that. Because, for example, the payer in the United Kingdom, which is NICE, they're everything but NICE, but it's the National Institute of Clinical Excellence. NICE actually looks beyond the classical medical data. So they won't just look at survival and disease-free progression. If you have good data to show that the quality is better, the independence and all that, if the data is good, and remember what good is, representable and reproducible, they will look at that. The Germans, the Krankenkasse, refused that. And he said, I will only look at it if it's an improved mortality. And I said, I disagree. Because mortality is the cheapest point. I just paid a funeral, 6,000, including everything, the coffin and everything. It's a lot cheaper. So you're even stupid, so stupid as a pair that you're avoiding what is the cheapest cost. So we had a bit of a discussion. Anyway, um, so let me see. Oh, so why, uh, there is, um, so there was a lot of disagreement, but the good news is in the same way as the patient community is beginning to organize, um, which is great. This is one of the things of MP. All these little organizations have come together. Fortunately, we also see the regulators beginning to organize, which and the, the big ones were always EMA for Europe and FDA for the US. They're, they're now talking, and they're beginning to use the same criteria, which is very good. You are laughing, but I can tell you, when I started my career, in, 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 so in the early 90s, every regulator had even for animals different requirements. For some reason, the Japanese like mice, right? But the Germans for the same test would accept beagle dogs, but not mice, right? And so this, and then they, one would accept 10 dogs and two monkeys, and the other one would have two monkeys. There was no arrange, no agreement. And as a company, it meant much more money because you have to do all these different tests for all the different markets much slower. And for the patient, it means waiting a few more years to get the drug. So 25 years ago, something big started as ICH, the International Conference for Harmonization. And today, it's great that at least the preclinical part of the dossier, this part, is now harmonized in the world. So you need to do it one time, and the Japanese will accept it, uh, here, when it comes to patients, it's different. For example, Korea still always requests 60 Korean patients. You can come with 6,000 patients from anywhere else in the world. They will want 60 from Korea. The Russians want 80 from Russia. The US wants 300 from US, etc., etc. But at least this part is already harmonized. Now, to the endpoints, which is after this, and I still have to go to phase three, but I'm not yet there. There's a very good movement that has started in 2014. Another abbreviation for you to write down, and it's called ICHOM. And that's the International Consortium for the Harmonization 
of outcome measures, ICHOM, right? It was started not by pharma, which should make a lot of you feel more happy because it's more credible. It was started by a very big consultancy company. You have like Deloitte's and Belston Consult, one of those. I'm not going to name the name. Academia, in particular, it was the Karolinska Institute in, in Sweden. And Hond came very, very quickly afterwards. But uh, And who was the third partner? Oh, it's Peter, Stefan. Who is the third? Oh, yes. Um, it was um, the University of Harvard, the business school because they wanted to have a more standardization. It's this Michael Porter, Michael Porter, very well-known business guru, um, who basically um, started with the idea that um, the healthcare should be based on the value, right? And what is value in economic terms, because he's an economist, value in economic terms is the price of the desired result divided by the cost of getting it. Which is quite right. And that also shows why it's perfectly individual. If I tell you what's the value of this, it'll be different for you. Because you will tell me uh, the price will be the same. Uh, no, the cost will be the same. I will buy, sell it to you for 10. But maybe for you it's a lot more valuable, right? Now, that means that the desired outcome, this one here, it's everything but desired outcome. He said, we need to harmonize outcomes. And so iChum was founded in 2014 with a very ambitious objective. They wanted by 2017, which is three years later, to have agreed outcome measures for 50% of the world's disease burden. That's huge. And you know what? They did it. Yes, they did it. So you can go to ichom.org and you can look at which diseases they've already worked. And for all the diseases, they have the same approach. And I've been part for two of them to help it create. They create a wheel. And they basically say, and this is total simplification, there is this what the doctors find important. There is this what the scientists find important. There is this what the patients find important. And there is this. So they have these always the same coming dimensions. And then they start working with these groups to find out what is the best outcome here. And then they put percentages and say, okay, in this disease, this one is going to be 56%, this one 28, this one 10. And I'm not going to put the number because I can't calculate. It's 100 minus these, okay? And that allows you to know how to study that disease. And this is great, because for the first time in history, academics, industry, researchers everywhere can start adopting the same language. When we say this drug has value, then you have to say, what does it do here? And it could be that it only works here, which means your maximum effect is going to be 56. Could be that you do 30 of the 56 here, 20 of the C. So it's going to be different. Different drugs can still do the same, but against the same reference. And this is very important, specifically because there is this patient dimension in there right now, which wasn't the case before. All right? And this is where you and your community can add value by becoming an active player in these discussions. I do not know, and I don't have a live internet connection here, otherwise we could go to the website and see which of the disease you're interested in are there and what it looks like. Because everything that comes out is public knowledge, which is also quite good. So it's, it's shared by everybody. All right, let's see where we are, because we... Okay, the endpoint selection, I've talked about that. So today, most research... Five minutes. So today, most researchers will um, still take the medical point of view. And sometimes that's really stupid. For example, there's a disease for the strength of the muscles, where you progressively lose the strength of your muscles until you can no longer breathe, because it starts in the foot and it comes up and then basically you suffocate. It's a really bad disease. Uh, and what the test that the doctors had always used is, can you still do the six-minute walking test? But six-minute walking test is ridiculous. It's not, I saw that with my father, who took two years on his way out. and it progress, there's, there, It's not a linear curve. Eight meters is not better than six meters. There are certain things 
For example, from three to two meters means you can no longer go to the bathroom. And from two to one means you can no longer reach the seat. And they are much more valuable than being able to go 100 to 150. And so this is where patients come in, in saying, what is the value? Whereas classically, statisticians have simply said it's linear. 200 meters is double as good as 100, is double as good as 50, and that's not true. So this is where Achim is doing the work to kind of measure. Because what the parents said of these children is as long as they can use their hands, they are not socially isolated because they can still go on Instagram, YouTube, and all of that. But it's when they lose the f power of their hands, which is way after they stop walking. So they're already, that's what we want you to work on. But then you have to start to, uh, the regulators to convince that they should use it. And that's why an independent organization is so important. All right, no more time. Though. The drug testing, which when? Um, I've done zero, preclinical, one and two. Phase three is basically the proof. This is where you put your money where your mouth is. You think you know the dose. You think you know how it works. Now you need enough, remember, representability, reproducible. You need enough people to show that it's not a chance. And those studies can go from 10 to 10,000, depending on what the parent. But this is, for the company, the most expensive one because they're usually very, very big. And when I say expensive, you have to calculate that a patient, a f what we call a fully loaded study participant, so if you take all the costs of the study and you divide it by the number of them, is now today for small molecules between 50 and 80,000, and for anything which is new, like antibodies or proteins, you're between 100 and 300,000 for every patient. So if you need to do a 200 patient study, you know exactly what budgets we're talking about. So we talked about that. Case history, back to the case history where everything started. There is a, um, a scale, and I'll give you, I'll, I'll send it through Alfonso, two things. A website with a slide deck of the things I talk, more structured, from the National Institute of Health, all right? That's in the US. And it's publicly available, and it's made for the lay public. And so you can take your time, go back, and look at the slides. But I thought it was better to have the discussion. You, that's There's a second one is an article um, also um, that goes and explains the process. So you can, at your ease, read it up, and I'll give it to you, and then you can share it uh, to everybody who wants. You can even put it on the website. Because I wanted to take public things that you can always share with everybody. Right? Uh, why was I there? OK, anyway. Ah, case history. There's one slide on there which shows a ladder. And it goes for the, the strength of the evidence. Always with the two criteria, representability, reproducibility. So there's a case history, one. A case series, ten of them. And then you have a cohort, which is a bigger group of people. Et and so all the different types of studies are on the ladder. And on the top, still the holy grail is randomized, controlled clinical trials. Randomized means that chance decides whether you're in group from Peter or Bart. It's blinded, so the doctor doesn't know, you don't know, which all of this is to avoid bias. But those are the very expensive ones. So, cases, clinical trial, sample size we talked about, administration dose, how to select a trial, that's one two, we talked about. Ah, here. This is a good one. I really like it coming up, because what we see at the end of the study is sometimes very striking, that we see in some countries, we see better results than in others. And when we start digging deeper, we find false data. And the FDA and the regulators will always go to two things. It's the one country or the one side that if you take it out of the analysis, changes the outcome. So with statistics, you can find out which side was the most important contributor to what you see. They will always take that one out and do the study reanalysis without that side or that country. And if that changes the result, then they basically will not approve. So what happens in some countries? In some countries, access to drugs is a real issue. And so patients are desperate when they go into this new drug, right? And so they know that if they reported a lot of adverse events, that maybe the doctor will stop them. And so they actually start saying something different. Do you feel better? Oh yeah, so much better. That's strange, because your blood count is different. But I feel so much better, right? 
And, and it goes both ways. It's on the African side, but on the same. In, in Japan, the culture is one of extremely deep respect to the doctor. And if you report an adverse event to, to the doctor, you're basically telling him he didn't do a good job. So in Japan, your arm has to fall off before a patient reports an adverse event. Where in France, they will report lots of itches. So there's a the interpretation. I could talk an hour about all these biases. But let me say that this is a real problem. But in the end, this may help that individual, but it can hurt all the others. Because if the study becomes negative, and remember, negative means it does not answer the question. Because if you need 1,000 patients to get there, and if this site has 20 patients, you now only have 980, and maybe you just can't make the statistics. And that's the worst there is. So it's a real problem, and this is why it's so very important to work with patients to design the clinical studies, so that the studies are doable, to create the trust, and to explain very well that if you report adverse events, you cannot be kicked out of a clinical study. Unless it is really harmful for yourself. The only one who can kick you out of a study is yourself in the first place. At any time, you have the right. And some patients want to stay in a study because they want to get my, their patient, uh, their doctor angry. You have the full right at any time to change. But also, if the company, the sponsor, or the academic institution see something that they feel is too dangerous, they can unilaterally kick you out. That's true. But the intent of both is the right. Now, life is not perfect, so I know there's no rule that can prevent this from happening. Okay, have I answered most of the question? I think I have. All right, so you're going to get two references of Alfonso. One is the slide deck, just goes more systematically than I did, and one is the article. And if you have any other question, just send it to Alfonso, who can contact me, and then I'm happy to answer. All right? I think it's time for lunch then.